I'm out here in the field with Joe Brecker, who farms in Rutland, North Dakota. And Joe has been a great mentor and advisor to me throughout the soil health journey from the day I started at NDSU. I think your Thank farm you, was one of the first ones I visited. <laughs> and I love learning alongside Joe. And so this is a field that we've been to a few times in the eight years I've been here. And so maybe we'll talk a little bit about what's happening this year. One of the things that really struck me in this field was why you're using the practices you're using. And there's something about strip till and erosive slopes and... Most of my farm, as you know, is on the flatter side, heavy clays. We live right at the, I live right at the base of the Katota Prairie here and uh, Lake Agassiz, ancient Lake Agassiz kind of lapped at these hills here and formed lake bed soils on a lot of my farm. But now we're up in the front bench of the Coteau here, and uh, this would be in the uh, FSA office or NRCS office. This would be HEL, right? Highly erodible land. And it is because of slope pr primarily, and soil type, but primarily because of slope. We have some pretty steep slopes on this piece. So doing tillage on this land for sure it's not an option because of erosion, but it's also not an option because of farm program. I, I can legally strip till this and still uh, meet the provisions of the farm program, but I've strip tilled this in the past without such good results because the water will come down these slopes and they're fairly, they're, they're steep in places and then long in others and uh, the water accumulates and, and it, it can erode right down those those strip till tracks uh, and I, I've just never really been a big fan of strip till on slopey land. And you can kind of see that from that, that knob behind us. I can imagine what that would look like with strips exposed. Absolutely. What the rain might do. Right. And I, I it, it's not that I haven't been a pretty big strip till fan. I strip tilled for close to 25 years. Before it was a thing, right? Before it was a thing, <laughs> yeah. I started strip tilling in uh, 1989 and strip tilled for many years. But I always was looking for a way to get the advantages of strip till because there are advantages, right? We, we know there's advantages to strip till. Oh, mainly uh, a, a different seed bed for the corn you're planting. Um, so a little warmer, possibly a little drier, and the combination in the springtime to get corn planted early uh, gives you an edge, right? It gives you that edge. So how, how could I get that edge uh, without tillage? That's what I was hoping for. So uh, Kelly Cooper, our farm manager for CCSP at the time, and this now is going back at least 10, maybe 12 years ago, uh, ended up putting some cover crops in rows to avoid the vininess of the peas the next year. Okay, so and, planting between pea rows? Is right, so, so he planted peas in 30 inch rows and then planted radish in between the peas. And the idea was to so the planter didn't have to run where the peas were because the peas in the springtime can be viney and interfere with the planting process. Well, what we found was a nice mellow seed bed prepared by Mother Nature, right? Prepared by the plants we planted. And also it was drier because of the cover crop. So the cover crop achieved uh, the dryness part and also the mellowness part. All right, so I, I brought that home to my farm from CCSP and, and it was, it was it, it really has worked great. Well then one year after visiting with Woody Van Arkel at the lodge, <laughs> right? old Woody, old right? Woody. He put a, put a picture up on the screen on his presentation, and here was this black, dead cover crop. And I'm like, what, what is that, Woody? And he, he said, that's fava bean. When it dies, it turns dark in color. And I thought, well, golly, I guess I should try fava bean. <laughs> and so this is now, it's gone on for half a dozen years or so of just experimenting with it in plots. Now, the last three years, I've actually incorporated fava bean in my bio strip till. And I'm loving it. The fava bean plant itself has a beautiful, aggressive, it's a, an aggressive plant, has a tap root. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's a legume, so it produces its own nitrogen as long as you can find the right 
inoculant. And that's what we're seeing here, right? I mean, the dark green are those fava bean strips because they're fixing. They're fixing in. At this point. Right. The rest of the plants out here are just scavenging what's available and what comes available through the natural processes. But the fava bean, they're making their own ends. So they're, they're king out here, right? Okay, so we have a plant, a beautiful plant, beautiful root structure, extremely cold tolerant. Like this plant does not give up until the ground is frozen. It can freeze off and then reshoot from the bottom and come back again. Uh, but it, it, even to freeze off, it has to get to below 25 degrees. So very frost tolerant. So it'll, if you put it in the ground, it'll grow a long time. Uh, I did mention though, you really need to find an inoculant that will stimulate the nodules or ino actually inoculate with the right strain of bacteria for okay, they're specific. Bobby. They're not the same as soybean it, or peas. They're not, or... yeah, and, and they're not even the same as some of the pea and lentil okay. inoculant, which they say on the packages they are, but they aren't. Do some homework, get the right inoculant. Um, I think I found the right inoculant now, it's working. Well, and I've heard Marisol say you need 60 days of growth on a legume to make it produce its own nitrogen, nitrogen to offset the cost of seed. And so that makes sense. It's probably been out here close to 60 days. So this was planted right around the first, it was the first week in August. Okay. So okay. now we're okay. sitting in the first week in October, right? right? So it's been out here for two months. And, and it has, because it's so cold tolerant, it likely has another month to grow or close to it. So I, and it's really kicking in now. So the fact that it's producing its own nitrogen uh, and there's still some water in the soil and it has a nice tap root, it'll go down and get water. Um, I think this plant will get, if it's 18 inches tall now, um, I fully expect it to get 30, 35 inches, 36 inches tall before it succumbs to winter. Okay, so now that much biomass, Joe, does that freak you out at all? None or? whatsoever, not with this plant. Not with this plant, because when this plant dies, the first thing happens is these leaves, almost like a sunflower plant, they, they turn dark chocolate brown, and then over winter, they all just kind of fall off and lay on the ground, and the stems are dark. What you have then is in the springtime, you have this dark stubble uh, right where you're planting your corn. The roots have done all the work, the ground is mellow, couldn't be a better seed bed. And then you have, on top of that, a little additional uh, temperature in that strip because of the color. At least, it appears like it has, and I've, I've tested it with thermometer at seeding time, and it seems to work. Well, that's so we we followed your a play out of your playbook at uh, the share farm in Morton using some fava bean, flax, and radish and biostrip till out there into wheat stubble, and we collected um, temperature and moisture data. And the moisture certainly in the fall was was less within those strips than it was just on residue, which okay. I think is good. That's what we want. We want to dry out that strip a little bit before winter. And then in the spring, when we were looking at it, it was a little bit warmer. Um, so, okay. so there's some data now. It was measurable. It was measurable. Yeah, it was and measurable. that's all it takes. And you know, we had it all relative to a conventional till strip. And the, the bio strips were similar to that conventional till strip. And I suppose that's what's most important, really, is, is you want it to be like conventional tillage as far as warmth and getting into it the next spring. So. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Uh, but with the, with the <laughs> advantage of a, there, there is no better seed bed. That, than a dead annual plant that, that, was, that had roots in the soil. When it dies, it leaves the most mellow seed bed, and since this is an annual plant. Now, some of the things here, the other plants we have out here, okay, here we've got rye. Now, rye is a winter annual, has an amazing root system on it, right? Look at that. So it's great for soil health, we know that. It survives the winter, keeps the biology going because it stays alive over winter. Managing moisture. And it's using moisture, okay. But we also are a little concerned about planting corn into this crop. Yeah, I say that to a lot of people, to not do corn into rye. So, so I, what I was just telling you, Abby, is, is last spring I did this same system, but I used uh, Roundup in April uh, along with liquid nitrogen, and I put a band of fertilizer right over the top of the, where the fava beans were and then I killed the rye. If, I, if it was a field that was rye the year before, so I had rye in it. Okay. Now I think this fall, I'm gonna come in here with Select, with those band nozzles, and just spray out the rye to kind of get that process started of breaking the rye down, just to make sure I don't have rye interfering with the growth of the corn plant. Okay. Because I know 
I know that, that this can, um, this is awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. Right here, right. Jackhammer Rabbit, this is awesome. This is awesome. Purple top turnip, right? So these are all plants, plus you throw a little, let's see, where's my... Did you pull a flax out? Where's my flax <laughs> plant? I have a bigger one than that. Where'd it go? <laughs> it's hard to find all in right. all this stuff, Joe, isn't so, it? So <laughs> anyway, take my word for it. I, you can see the flax here. So there's, flax is a beautiful crop too, because it's also a dark stubble and it stays standing, so it doesn't lay down. So any plant that's standing up, even though it's got tough residue, is not a problem for the planter because you can just go right through it. Mm -hmm. So with all these different cover crops, oh, here's my flax, I had it, <laughs> right here. And flax has a nice root system, and flax is extremely cold tolerant. So this will grow right up to the end too. And it's got such a stiff stock on it that it's, this plant is already big enough and mature enough so that uh, if this succumb, succumb to, to winter tomorrow, this plant would stay like this all winter long. So you won't have to plant into it. You'll, you'll plant into standing flax right. residue. Plus, it's a snow catch, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, you have a nice even cover across your whole land. You don't have just piles of, of snow. If you get a snow, you can get it to stay even across the land. And consistency is what you're looking for. So these groups of cover crops are just some of the ones that I use ahead of corn. But this one, I like to get managed in a zone situation. And now that gets back to the wide spacing, right? Mm -hmm. There are things you can do with the wide spacing that are difficult to do with, say, a standard 30 or 20 inch row. This will go to 60 inch corn, This right? will go to twin row 60. Twin row 60, okay. Just where the fava beans are planted. And uh, because you have that 60 inch distance to play with, you can manage fertility, wheel traffic, mm -hmm. um, spraying some plants out, leaving others. You know, it, it just, it does lend itself to some, to some advantages. As long as we can get it to yield, um, I'm loving it so far. <laughs> well, this has certainly been a good year for your, for your cover crops, and this was seeded after rye harvest, so, um, so that's why all the volunteer rye in here. Right, so this was free. That was free, and then other you than, the... Other than I didn't get it in the hopper, it yeah. was free, right? <laughs> Do you think, okay, if you're looking at it, and this is maybe a loaded question, but if you're looking at bio strip till versus strip till, you know, with strip till there's a big upfront investment, obviously in the equipment, but do you, do you think that this is cost the same, is less expensive, is more expensive? Um, your gut feeling on, on whether this practice is... Well, I probably, as we're kneeling here in this crop, what you see here, um, I have, uh, I have a good $40 an acre invested okay. in, in, in what you see here. Do I think it's worth it versus doing tillage? Uh, absolutely, absolutely I do. The long-term soil health, uh, if you have livestock, the short-term soil health of it. If you don't have livestock, the long-term soil health of it, um, I think will pay you dividends. Uh, down down the road. This green manure crop, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. is a green manure crop whether you ran it through a cow or not. It's still living residue uh, that that with roots, with living roots, that's the big part, right? Right. Because it energizes the biology in the soil. Uh, these plants are, these plants, just by the way nature uh, designed, are getting phosphorus and potassium and sulfur and all of those mineral nutrients in the soil, it's getting those released through relationships with the biology in the soil. And then they're in these plants and you're not harvesting them, you're not removing them. Right. So then, is it most likely that when these plants die, those minerals are probably more available probably than before that? At some point, right? Some maybe point. it's not the next year, but maybe the following year or the following year, or you're keeping it in the system right. and making it so the more you can get knocked loose from those chemical bonds in the soil and get them into an organic form, the more likely you're going to have use of them sometimes to grow crops. Well, this is a really cool concept. I hope people try this even bio strip till on 30 inch row spacing with just radish is, is a great fit into a wheat stubble or something like that yes. just to try it.
Um, and I've heard of farmers doing that with sugar beet plates and their planters and just putting down the radish and keeping it pretty inexpensive and then taking your system and ramping it up as you learn more about it is, is a yep. great way to do it. So the old, the old saying, there's a million ways to skin a cat. Now that might not be really politically correct in some, you know, some company right, here, but, yeah. but but I think people understand the meaning of that, right? Right. There's a million ways to plant a cover crop. And uh, it's just it's just getting it done is the main thing.